if your son and he got accepted into whatever college to study medicine, he looked at you and says, Mom, no, I want to go and study Islam. What are you going to say? Nobody is answering me. No. No. I wish I heard yes. Reality. I had this discussion. They bring me. The child brought me. And he said, my, and his parents, mashallah, practicing. And the mother looked at me and says, let him finish medical school. And then let him study Sharia. And I said, subhanallah. Why not, why not let him study Islam and then go to medical school? Allah said this in Surah Al-A'la and most of you read it every single day. Glorify the, the name of your Lord. You prefer, the, and Allah called it dunya. You prefer this lower life. You prefer this lower life. So basically, basically, can you do it both? The answer is yes. In general, medical school with Sharia or with another is difficult because it takes a lot of your time. And I, I know colleagues who did both. They are a lawyer, non-Muslim. He's a lawyer and he's a physician. But he did physician and then he did, did a law school. You choose which one first. I personally, and it's not because I'm biased, it's because I've seen it as a physician, study Islam first. Because in general, medicine corrupt people. It's a, a profession that inject arrogance in me. Because everybody listen to what you say. And people praise you all the time. Unless you really have this heart that's connected with Allah, it's going to be very difficult. Plus, it's a demanding job. Any specialty you're going to go, it's a very demanding job. And unless you're connected with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will lose that connection. Tell me when you're on call for 14 hours and come and pray, Aisha. I lived it. So always I tell people, let them study Sharia first. Let them apply for medical school, get accepted, and take a break. I don't know about Australia, but that's very common in the United States. Take a break, go and study, come back and continue. And in reality, this is actually what we need. Muslims these days, we need both. We need educated people in every cons in every specialty, not only medicine, but everything. We need we need a good Muslim reporters, journalists, TV presenters. A politician, we need them. Not only them, the professions that will bring money or professions that we are used to. Everything we need. We need a good Muslim nurses. We, yeah. So combine, absolutely. Maybe you cannot do it together at the same time. Yani it's a little bit challenging. Choose one, which I usually say, choose medicine first. I mean, choose Islamic studies first. Okay, that's another good question. When dealing with a um, negative person slash situation, how do you ensure your speech and thoughts internally stay good and righteous? There's a lot of negatives, negative people, toxic people we call. They say things they shouldn't say, right? And I, most people, when they say things, any. Very few, but mostly they don't know they said it. And they said it in this way, or the impact it had on other people. Some does, but majority they don't, but it came out. Very simple answer, but not very easy to practice. If you are connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to say it again. Meaning, you worked on your connection. Your answer will be not a single word. You're just going to zip it. Hassan al-Basri has a beautiful statement. When I learned it years ago, subhanAllah, and he's a man connected to Allah is not the right word. They used to describe him, إِذَا رُؤِيَ ذُكِرَ اللَّهِ When you see him, Allah is remembered. Who was he? 
and this his name is Al Hassan, the beauty. And when you read in the books, they don't call Al Hassan Basri, they call Al Hassan the beauty. And he said the following This is when you are connected with Allah practically. He said, Ma nadar to be basari. I've never looked with my own eyes. Wala to be udni. And I've never heard with my ears. Wala batash to be yadi. And I've never used my hand. Wala mashay to be rijli. And I have never, ma is no option. And I've never walked with my hand. Illa, but. Take a second. Think. About what? That's Al Hassan al Basri, not you and me. Do I like it? Is it going to be good? How people will think about it? There's nothing to do with this. And he said, Is this is pleasing to Allah or this is displeasing to Allah? That's the only question. Now I know. Let's say I know the answer or someone told me. And he said, If this act, or saying, or not saying, or not responding. Fi ta'a, it's pleasing to Allah, taqaddamt, I'm doing it. Wa in kana fi ma'asiyah, and if this is disobedient to Allah, feeling, saying, grudges, action, whatever it is, disobedient to Allah, I don't do it. So here are, here you are. Look at the question. Dealing with a negative person. What the negative person is doing or, or saying, they need to answer it. It's not my business. I'm not going to be asked about why you said that. You said it. And you will not be asked about why did I say that. I am going to be asked. So here you go. Someone said something negative to me. Right? What I am going to do? Ask the question. Talk to Allah. What do you want me to do? What will please you? And if you keep doing this daily basis, wallah, you will hear the answer. And I said his name. He will tell you. You will control your anger and you don't know how did you do that. You will not answer. But you need the first part. It's not going to come as a magic. It's not a pill. I swallow it. Or it's a button, I press it. This is work and actions and you're connected with Allah and you got up at 3 a.m. in the morning and you prayed alone and you cried and you picked up that Quran and you don't want that and you did these things and you don't want that but they are pleasing to Allah. This is how the response. This when he said in the hadith I shared before the break, when he seek refuge in me, I'll give it to him, it's in here. When, you are so, when it's so easy to respond, and it's very easy to say it, and much harder to not, but you control. And you said, it's not pleasing to Allah, I'm not going to say it. It's actually, you see it. You see it. And sometimes even you, I've, I've seen, where people really irritate them, and then they control. It's not because they are so super and special, but they had, this is how I call it, what credit you have with Allah? I didn't say what Allah gave you. I said, what credit? What's your credit score? Do you have credit score here? Right? Credit score and everybody's compete. And to have a higher credit score. What is your credit with Allah? Meaning, what are things you did it? For him only. Nobody even better, nobody saw you. And you were not expecting anything, but you were building the credit. The higher the credit, it comes here. As Rasul said, Ta'arraf ila Allah fil rakha ya'rifuka fil shidda. Know Allah at time of prosperity. Everything is going my way, no problem. But I know Him and I remember Him. Ya'rifuka fil shidda. When the time of adversity, time of need, he will know you. And how he will know me? He makes me quiet. Or even better, he makes me respond in a nice way. But that doesn't come because I'm smart. Or because I studied. Or because I have a PhD in this and that. It comes only from him when I have credit with him. So work 
on your credit. We have only three minutes, subhanAllah. Tayyip, bismillah. If you have a sin from the past, like debt with interest, and you are repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do you rectify it? Do you leave the interest debt or pay it back? Very good question. And this applies to every sin. I get this so common, subhanAllah. Yani, this is actually a, yani, an okay sin. But I'm getting, subhanAllah, Allah, we Muslims are getting to a, to a place of sins that 10 years ago, nobody dared to ask the question. I, sometimes I say to myself, I lost my mom a long time ago, and I said, if she, Allah, brings her back, she will say, Allah, send me back. What happened to the world? What happened to us Muslim? Zina, relationship outside marriage between Muslims. I'm not talking about the others. It's becoming so normal that almost wherever I am, I get the question. So I, I sinned major. These are major sins. Hadi major sin. Interest are major sin. Riba is major sin. No one will justify it. Nobody will tell you. Very few exceptions. So I am dealing with interest. I have done this. I have done that, including backbiting. It's a major sin. I want to rectify it. In general, and then I'll come to this question. In general, number one, you have to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to him. At-ta'ibu min al-dham kam al bala the person, and this is a hadith of Rasulullah the person who repent from a sin is the same as a person who didn't do it. And this is very important for us. Not you did the sin, but somebody else did the sin. Don't keep reminding them of, remember when you did that? Don't do that. Because Allah will test you with that sin. And especially if it's between spouses and whatever you did before, خلاص, done. You repented. You repented truly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is raised completely. Then, so number one is you need to repent. Number two, you don't keep doing it. So this major sin has to be removed. The third, which is the most difficult, and that's why I mentioned backbiting, because if it involved the right of another person, you ha that person has to forgive you. Imagine this. That person has to forgive you. Otherwise, on the day of judgment, there's a lot to pay. So for the interest, this may sound a little bit sharp. Absolutely. Absolutely. This moment, you leave it. I don't care you sell the house. I don't care you go and rent. Interest is major sin. Allah said it in the very strong verse in the Quran. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, taqullaha wa daru ma baqiya min al-riba. Oh believer, and this is to the believers, he didn't say ya ayyuhal nas, he said ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, you and me. It's a sort of al-baqara, the cow. Taqullah, haf taqwa, be Allah conscious, wa daru ma baqiya min al-riba. Leave and stay away from any trace of interest. Now look at that second one is the scary. فَإِنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا If you're not going to do it, فَأَذَّنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Wait, and Allah will declare war, subhanAllah, against you. And now you wonder and tell me, why we are Muslims where we are? Why is this happening to the Muslims? So absolutely, Absolutely. Wallah, I've seen this. This is a friend of mine who her, I didn't know that her parents, her father, you know, was the usual people who come to the West, you know, worked hard, did whatever. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened his heart to start practicing Islam. And this is from the mouth of the daughter. And she said, one day he was in the masjid, learned this, uh, uh, he was in a lecture that interest is haram. He didn't even know interest is haram. And his wife is non-Muslim. I know this family. It's not a story someone told me. I know them. And their wife is non-Muslim. They spent three years building this house. 
And they took, of course, loan from the bank. So the, the, the husband learned this, that loan was with the interest is haram. He came back, told the non-Muslim wife, I'm selling this house and I'm going to go and live in an apartment. The non-Muslim wife said, do it. They stayed for 20 years. Again, I know this family, but I'll tell you what Allah gave them. 20 years, they are living in this rental house. I visited them. Then after 20 years, Allah opened the opportunity, unplanned, where he was able to buy a house, fixed it, and lived in it. The, the reward is not this house. Look at their children. I know the family very well. Look at the daughter, the older daughter. He has three daughters and a son. The children that you all want to have. The mother became a Muslim very recently, maybe five years ago, because of the daughter. The duha of the daughter. Sins, this is a major sin. Unless you really cannot find a place to live, that's when loan from the bank is allowed which I found it very unlikely. And you can't go and rent an apartment. You can tell me I'm going to live in an apartment. I, I'm going to say it's your choice. It's your choice. And then when I am in that private interview, I have to tell him why did I do it. So absolutely. And alhamdulillah, the question itself is a good question. And this, whoever is asking is you have, now you are thinking of putting Allah number one in your life. Because now you're, you're, you're having this scenario of everything in my life, the tick, the boxes that needs to be ticked. Yes, you need to actually, you do not pay the debt. And I don't know if you know the details of how the, you pay three times, roughly, three times the price of the house when you take a loan from the bank. Don't you think the, the bank will give me a loan, right? Because... I am someone special. No. Because they make a lot of profits from that interest. And that's subhanAllah, I was just talking to my real estate this morning about something else, and I was like, how does that work? And she said, well, if the, if the regular interest they pay, I, I can't remember the year, but she said the first, I don't know, every payment you're putting is going to the interest. None of what you pay in the beginning, goes to your ownership of the house. It all goes to interest. And that's why Allah made it haram. And why did Allah make it haram? The interest, because it's injustice. It's injustice to human being. So Alhamdulillah Rabbana, it came in and, and we answered, we'll take one up, it's 9.05, where are the organizers? <laughs> Keep going, till when? You need to smile. <laughs> she extended 9-10. No, I'm lying. Okay, <laughs> bismillah. Don't ask me about... Uh, oh, now she explained it. Salam, what about H-E-C-S debt? Which I have no idea what is it. But then she said, uni loans. Now I learned uni is university. Okay, so this is a very important question because this is now an issue. When you give, and again, everything I'm saying is not my opinion. When you give an answer about the deen, when you say this is haram and this is halal, okay, go and do it, don't do it. What is the sequences of it on the ummah? So this question comes up very frequently because it's, I don't know about Australia, but I can tell you about the United States, it's so expensive to send a child to a university. Yani you, they, the students come out from university, we call it six figures debts. Yeah, there's no university per year less than 25,000. That's the minimum. There is universities per year, 75 to 100,000 per year. Yani medical school, they come out and they are in debt about a million dollar. Yeah, it's very expensive. So now you come in here, and you say, okay, I'm not going to do loans. Let's say your parents are two, two teachers. 
or your father works and the mother took care of you. So what is their income? And there's a three and four children. So now Muslim Ummah is facing, and this is how scholars reach to this. Now the Muslim Ummah is facing the following. There is either they go and take the loans after they exhaust all the other possibilities versus you're going to say it's haram and in 50 years, 80% of the Muslim Ummah will have a high school degree because they can't go to colleges. From there, they said the following, and this actually was in England, and this is in the United States. I don't know about Australia, but I'm sure it's the same. Number one, you as parents, from the day you deliver that baby, mother, do not give, get gifts, that gifts is useless. Open a bank account called college fund. And any time you celebrate anything, tell everybody who is going to come and bring you gifts that you don't need. Honestly, they do. A lot of people does, do that in the States. Imagine from year one to the 18, right? Every year, whatever it is, Eid, uh, if you celebrate birthday, whatever it is, the, the boy or the girl, uh, you know, they, were, they got a trophy, at work, whatever it is. Say it clearly. Don't get, I have people who said this to me. Don't, don't bring any gifts. If you want to get a gift, this, just bring a check. It's going to go to, and write on it, college fund. By the time that the, the, the son or the daughter are ready to go to college, you have a good amount of money, maybe not to cover it all, but at least you're not going to get six, 700,000 loan. It may be 100. Number two, and this is all, I don't know again about Australia, but I know this in the States. You reach out to people. And I know people did it. And reach out to them and ask them for a non-interest loan. They call it Qarda Hasana for the Indo-Pak people. No interest loans. People will do it. I know that. Again, not I read it, I've seen it. They will do it. They don't have children for example, or their children grew up and finished and they paid for their education. And now you reach out to them, you got accepted to law school, you got accepted to medical school or any school. And they said, give it to me. And you write contract. And then you said, I'll pay it. If you exhaust everything, there's also some organizations. Again, I don't know about Australia, but I know that in the States, there's organizations which give loans, non-interest loans, Muslim organizations. Okay, this is becoming an issue. If you exhausted all that, that's when they allowed it. But take the minimum, they say. Yeah, you don't go and uh, rent an apartment and you can stay with your parents. Or don't go and do anything extravagant. Take the minimum because that's what they call it, maqasid al-sharia, the Essence of this deen, the goal of this deen, or the aim of this deen is what will happen if I say everything is haram, or I say everything is halal? What will happen? So for the uni loans, again, save, save for your children to take, reach out businesses, reach out to the rich people. Go. What's the worst thing? They will tell you no. Okay, alhamdulillah, I tried. I mean, put, put your ego pack it or send it and go and ask. Yeah, because like, oh, I don't want to go. They will say yes. No. How do you know? Maybe they will say yes. And if they said no, they said no. And then if this didn't work, then uh, you can. Okay. Um, halal banks. Are they truly halal? Okay. Anything that you need to know, it's halal or haram. You have to know they are based on what? What is a bank? It's not a place where I'm going to go and put my money. Of course, I know that. How does bank work? Bank is a company, like any other company, right? Companies sell, right? Anything. And you make profit. What do banks sell? Money, loans, 
because they make money from money. That's how it is. So when you say, but can I, can I put my money in the bank? Yes. But you put it in non-interest account. And even that, the hadith of Rasulullah applies. Sayati zaman ala ummati. A time is going to come on my ummah that even that person who does not want to deal with any interest, he will be touched by the dust of the interest. And how is that? When I put my money in the bank, what they are doing with my money? Giving it for a loan. Then I, I'm not getting the interest back, but the, but the bank is getting it. So halal bank, unless you're playing Monopoly. <laughs> oh, so there's a dua about the love of Allah. Jazakillahu khair. Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbak. Wa hubba kulla man yuhibbuk. Wa hubba kulla amalin yuqarribuni ila hubbik. That's a dua for Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam. Ya Allah, I ask you for your love. You know when you told somebody, please love me? Right? That's what you're telling Allah. Because the path to the love of Allah, as I shared with you, is not easy. But Allah can make it easy when you ask Him. So, Allahumma inni as'aluka, I am begging you, I'm asking you. Hubbak, love me. Wa hubbak kulla man yuhibbuk. And I want those who loves you to love me, because it's contagious. Wa hubbak kulla amalin yuqarribuni ila hubbik. And the love of every deed. Every day, because when you love something, you will do it. And the love of everything that will bring me close to your love. Ya Rabbi Ameen. And then there is a the second part. Allahumma ja'al hubbaka ahabba ilayya min nafsi wa ahli wal ma'u al-barid u'inda al-dhama'a. Ya Allah, make your love more beloved to me than me. Remember I told you the first obstacle is me. Me and people and even the cold water when I am thirsty. That's a dua actually of Sayyidina Dawood, they say. And we're going to take the last one because if you're not tired, I am not. And I'm not saying the truth. <laughs> طيب, this is a good one. I like when you ask about non-Muslims because we live among non-Muslims. There is a reason why Allah brought you and me and surrounded us by this. We will be asked about it. I have non-Muslim friends, but sometimes when they do things that I know goes, goes against Allah, I am only capable of praying that they be guided. What am I supposed to do if I wanted to do more? They act kinder and more Muslim than me. And they act like a Muslim more than me, she's saying in actions. Um, from time to time, I want them to be a Muslim. This is a beautiful question. That somebody cares about their friends and they care about Islam. Don't say they are kuffar. They're going to go to Jahannam. Why you are here? It's their country. Why you, why you look down at them? Who says you are better? Do you know how you're going to die? Do you know how they will die? So this low looking down at the non-Muslim needs to change. And one of the beautiful things I learned from my first teacher is look, he said, look at every non-Muslim as a potential Muslim. This morning, this, this afternoon actually, after Juma, I gave a shahada. Do you know how old was she? 14. Yeah. And who introduced her to Islam? Her two friends. The, the friends are in, Muslim, in, in a Muslim school. That's the, the school I visited. Where did they meet her? Because I asked, where did you meet? In the library. How many libraries we went? And she said they talked about it. And the girls are 15 and 15. And she says, I like it. This is what I want to be. 
literally this is what she said to me, because I asked her, I said, I like this connection in me. I was like, Ya Allah, give it to me and to every Muslim. 14. So absolutely. However, if they are doing things that is haram, obvious, not only you say th something, you don't be in that place with them because it's going to affect you sooner or later. If you are with people who always backbite, I can assure you, you're going to start backbiting. If you are people who, with, who smokes, you will be a smoker. This is actually the first question we ask patients. And they say, I'm a smoker. I said, since what age? 14. I said, who smokes in the house? It's so usually somebody. And if not, she says, all my friends smoke. If you're going to be, and this is actually for us Muslims, between Muslims, if you're going to be surrounding yourself with Muslims who are not practicing, good luck for your deen. It's going to disappear. Sooner or later, you will be affected. It's peer pressure. You all know that. And peer pressure is not only for teenagers. Peer pressure is for everybody. And there is a positive peer pressure, as I shared with you this morning, and there is a negative peer pressure. If they are doing haram, you should not be with them. True story happened to me, and we will end up here. Before I moved to California, I was in St. Louis, Missouri, and I moved to a new neighborhood, the only Muslim. They've never seen a Muslim before. Right? And the next door neighbors, beautiful couple, middle aged, a little bit older actually. And one day I was leaving the house, and this was before Ramadan. And I knew he was coming to talk to me. So I put the window lower and he said, Haifa, um, we are thinking normally when a new person moves to the neighborhood, we usually like to do a gathering. What a nice gesture, which is actually, this is us Muslim. And so I, I, have three, I have three questions for you. And immediately I was like, okay, Haifa, Bismillah, get ready. <laughs> this is how I felt. And he said, um, when is a good time for you? Like, this is not too bad. And I said, um, Ramadan is coming. He said, yeah, this is what I needed to know. When is Ramadan? I was like, this is a good start. So I said, this is, okay, we will do it after Ramadan. Second, he said, I know you don't eat drink. I, don't, I know you don't eat pork. Any other, other dietary restrictions? Very nice. Look at the third one. And I was waiting because I said, if he didn't ask, I am going to ask. And I am new in this neighborhood. You know, you don't want to, and you have to be nice to people. But also, I have to be, I'm a Muslim woman. Look at this one. He said, I know you don't drink, but do you sit with people who drink? And I said, no. He said, that's it. I'm going to tell people, everybody, we're going to we're going to serve juice. And I was like, Ya Rabbi, lak alhamd. Ya Rabbi, lak alhamd. If I was not an obvious Muslim, would he have asked me this question? Here you go. You need to be an, a Muslim, obvious Muslim, proud, not arrogant Muslim. Because this didn't come right away. This came about after two months. And then see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring us all back to him in the way that pleases him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who listen to the word of admonition and follow the best of it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I seek refuge from Allah, that I remind you of him and I forget myself. If I have said anything correct, it's only from Allah and Allah only. And if I said anything bad or incorrect, it's from me, the impact, me, myself, the impact of shaitan on me. And I seek refuge that I remind you of him and forget, forget him. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa an astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi tasliman kathira. Please forgive me, I can't greet you all. Allah knows how much I really want to. But look at the numbers here. And if I, and if I, and may Allah reward you all. Then if I greet one, I have to greet everybody because that's your right. So please forgive me. The only thing I will do is I'm going to sign the books because I promised some of you. So if you have books, come in here. 
I was in Malaysia, and just to give you this, there was 1,200 women in that, in that room. Nobody moved or brought a book. Allah, I was amazed. And I said, I'm going to sign a book. Everybody was in line. The room, يعني, you look at the back, you barely you can see the back. And the line was all the way. The organizers come to me and says, يعني, Dr. Rahifa, this is going to be a, an hour or an hour and a half. And I said, they are waiting in line for an hour and a half. At least I'm sitting. So let's do it. Don't come and crumble here. Be in line, open it up like that so I can sign it right away. Tayyib, jazakumullahu khayran.